So welcome, I'm Jason Williams. I'm an assistant director here at the Cold Spring Harbor DNA Learning Center. Um, I see at least a couple of names. So I know that some of you have been joining us uh, a few times on this Meet a Scientist series. And uh, we know with everyone getting used to a virtual uh, presentation format, that's a fantastic opportunity for us uh, to really give you a chance to meet uh, some of uh, the lab scientists and this is targeted at a high school audience, both for students and for teachers, uh, to be able to uh, learn a little bit more about not only science, but the life of some of the scientists that work here at Cold Spring Harbor, which is behind me, if you haven't had the chance to visit, at least that's what it's looking like in the fall. And uh, let me just start out by directing you to the DNA Learning Center homepage and pointing out a few things just before we begin. I wanna make sure people know some of the things that are going on. So I'm gonna share screen and this is our DNA Learning Center homepage which you probably had to visit in order to uh, register and as you see uh, we are open for summer camp enrollments. Uh, in fact actually not only are we doing them here but we're opening up a brand new center in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, so if you're really looking to get away or if you happen to live in the city uh, see a little bit more about that on our website and then of course uh, in our Meet a Scientist series, which is here in the 2021 programs, uh, you will see um, past and upcoming events. And of course, uh, today we are very happy to have uh, Alexa with us. And she is a graduate student in the Shea Lab here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And she's going to be talking a little bit about how maternal experience shapes brain activity and also tell us a little bit about her uh, journey as a scientist. And I invite you to also come back and register uh, for our May event. And I believe that there is one more in June, if I'm right. Uh, so make sure that you uh, check back. And if you've missed any of them, uh, the videos for some of our previous ones uh, starting in the late uh, 2020 are still there and they're really nice uh, to take a look at. And since they're only 30 minutes, uh, you can really get through them and, and get a lot out in just a short amount of time. So uh, what I want to do is welcome uh, Alexa, who's joining us from the lab. And I'm going to turn it over to Alexa. And my last uh, statement to everybody is if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, you'll find that there's a Q&A where you can ask questions. And Alexa told me it's OK to interrupt her at any time with questions. If you have them, put them into the Q&A. Uh, that's preferable. And you'll you know, answer the question right at the moment. Or if it's one of those save it to the end questions, we'll save it towards the end and have a little bit of time uh, to have discussion then. So Alexa, everything is yours and I'll be in the background. And so everyone enjoy the presentation. All right, you can see my slides, they're back. Yeah, thank you. All righty. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and for inviting me to be part of such a great series. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. So I'm really excited. Um, as Jason mentioned, I am a third year student in the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory School of Biological Sciences. And I'll give you a little bit of uh, my background as to how I got here and a little bit about my dissertation work, which focuses on, as Jason mentioned, how maternal experience is shaping brain activity. But first, um, how I got here. Uh, so I'm from Rhode Island, which is this really, really tiny state if you zoom in all the way on the East Coast. Um, I went to my local public high school, and when I was there, I was really involved in a lot of different extracurricular activities. Um, I played the oboe, so I was in a lot of uh, musical ensembles. I played tennis. I was involved in student government, and all of this is to say that I basically wasn't very pigeonholed from the get-go into being like a, a STEM student. Um, I had a, a diverse range of interests that I liked to foster when I was when I was in high school. Um, I did take some some STEM classes, though. I found myself drawn to some of the science courses, particularly biology. So I, I took an AP bio course, I think in my junior year, and I found it really fascinating to be able to study kind of what was going on in my body as I was studying it, you know? So like learning about the immune system, red blood cells, um, gene transcription, gene expression. I thought that was all super cool. And I, and I wanted to know more about what was happening in my body. Um, so that's kind of what first got me interested in, in science. And so then when it came time to apply to colleges, they all put, you know, you have to put a, a perspective major on the application form. And, and a lot of them had this neuroscience thing. 
because like neuroscience, you know, I never, never thought that you could just study the brain for a living. That'd be so cool. That's the most meta way to understand your own body and, and what's going on. So I, um, many of those applications was like, yeah, I'll be a, I'll be a neuroscience major. Sure. Why not? So fast forward to when I get to my undergrad, um, I went to school in Boston, a little outside of Boston at Wellesley College. Um, so I moved a bit north, a bit more cold, a bit more snow. Um, I'm, I'm sitting there in, in my Neuro 100 like introductory level class uh, because I, I was a neuroscience major apparently. Um, and I absolutely adored it. I, I fell in love with neuroscience in that class. I, I loved being able to understand what was kind of going on in your own mind and how that may be leading to your perception of consciousness. And I also really appreciated the interdisciplinary um, approach that, that many neuroscientists take. You know, we draw from anything from physics to computer science, genetics, biology, cognitive psychology. And, and I really loved all those different lenses that you could look at the same problem with trying to decode and understand the brain. So I was, I was talking to my advisor one day and I was explaining all this to her and I was like, yeah, I really love understanding how this is working. Maybe I should be, you know, a pre-med um, on the pre-med track. So I love, you know, seeing what's going on in, in human bodies. And she was like, mm, I don't think so, Alexa. Uh, you talk a bit more like a, a basic scientist. You under, why don't, you want to understand the mechanisms of how things are, are happening instead of, you know, being able to just treat things, uh, which is of course more in the physician realm. So I was like, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Um, so I decided that I wanted to then join a lab and, and get some firsthand wet lab experience. So I, I cold called some um, professors, just sent them emails. I was like, can I join your lab? Do you have space and, and funding for me? I think this would be fun. I had no prior wet lab experience in high school. I didn't do any kind of science summer internship or anything like that. And I ended up landing in the Gobes lab. Um, this is Sharon Gobes here, it's her lab. Um, and we studied birds. Um, I thought that that was really cool. So I, I, wanted, I wanted in. Um, so these are zebra finch songbirds. They're native to Western Australia. And we study them because they're a really great model for speech acquisition and language. Um, one of the only models for, for such a study. And we study them because the way that these birds learn to sing their songs actually has many parallels with the vocal learning process that humans undergo as they begin to speak. Um, so I spent three and a half years doing that, um, studying these, these cute little birds. And um, in my junior year, I was really fortunate to um, have won an, an award from the Arnold and Mabel Beckman Foundation, um, and they supported me in, in many ways. Um, and uh, one of them was I, I basically got to go all over the world, really, to co different conferences and being able to present my findings and connect with colleagues and discuss science. And that was opening a lot of doors, and um, I, I really, really appreciated that. And one of those conferences, I, I happened to meet someone that is essentially why I'm here today. Um, I met a PI or a, a PI that used to be at Cold Spring Harbor, um, Ann Churchland. She's currently now at UCLA, but I met her at one of these conferences and got to talking to her. And she said, you know, there's, there's a graduate program at Cold Spring Harbor. And I had no idea that there was. I, I knew of Cold Spring Harbor Labs as you know, this place where really great research was done, but I didn't know that they had a, a graduate program where you could come and, and work towards and be granted your PhD. So she really put that on my radar. I went home that night and kind of, you know, looked it up. And uh, it seemed like a really great program. So I decided to apply and um, ended up being accepted and coming here. So I, I started here in 2018 with a, a cohort of up to another students. This is our most recent picture in um, a pre-COVID lab Halloween party. Um, and then grad school is kind of weird that you enter with all of these people, but then you all kind of you know, diverge and join individual labs based on your unique interests that we want to end up studying. Um, so I ended up joining uh, the Shea Lab led by Stephen Shea right here. Um, and we all have in the Shea Lab an interest in understanding social communication and behavior. And this was really fostered in my undergrad as I was working in, in the birdsong field. And so it was something that I wanted to continue pursuing in my graduate studies. So all of us in the Shea Lab basically wanna answer this fundamental question of how does maternal experience shape brain activity? Um, and to do that, we assess maternal behavior with a pup retrieval assay in mice. Um, so I'm going to show you what this behavior looks like as I explain it. But essentially, newborn mouse pups are born extremely susceptible to environmental insults. They're born blind, deaf, and unable to thermoregulate their own body temperatures. So it's really critical that they be taken well, they have 
you know, good mothers or, or good females there to, to take care of them. Oops. Oh, that's not going now. My bad. So essentially what happens is if these pups find themselves outside of the warmth and safety of the home nest, a female with maternal experience who's had pup exposure and kind of knows how to interact with these pups and what they need will learn to go out and basically retrieve all of those pups back to the nest one by one. And this is really critical for the survival of, of the offspring. So it's a really robust and, and relevant, important behavior for these females to engage in. And typically this is performed by the mother However, it is a learned behavior that's based upon the necessity for the retrieval behavior to occur. So what I mean by that is we can teach pregnancy naive females who we deem quote unquote surrogates, who don't have pups of their own, but are co-housed with a pregnant woman, or a pregnant uh, mouse and then her subsequent pups. And we can teach that surrogate to basically perform this retrieval behavior solely by having that pup exposure. So, um, we use them in the lab to kind of mitigate the effects of pregnancy hormones following perpetuation, but basically to really get at what drives the learning of this maternal experience dependent behavior itself. And so it seems like a pretty simple behavior, right? You just go out, you pick up the pup, you bring it back. It's actually very involved and, and very socially complex. And so this female here is integrating a lot of different there's pup odors in this cage, there's the visual placement of the pups, and importantly, there's also a really critical auditory cue that she's using to be able to execute this behavior with success. And that auditory cue is in the form of pup ultrasonic vocalization, so something produced by the pups themselves that you can kind of think of as a distress cry that will prompt the female to go out and bring them back. It's essentially the pup saying, I'm cold, come get me, bring me back to the nest. And so to give you an idea, these are ultrasonic vocalizations, but I pitch shift them down so you can hear them. This is kind of what they sound like. You kind of get the idea. There, there's these kind of whining, um, basically distressed cries. And so when the female with maternal experience hears those, she'll go out pick up the pups and bring them back to the nest. And we know that these are critical cues for kind of mediating and prompting this behavior for a couple of reasons. The first is that mute mouse pups, they aren't retrieved. So mute being they don't vocalize. And then second of all, if we lesion the auditory cortex, which is the part of the brain responsible for processing these auditory sounds, if we lesion that area, we actually abolish the behavior. These higher numbers indicate a poor performance. Um, so taking all of this together, it looks like the auditory cortex and these pup vocalizations are really important for, for mediating this behavior and getting those pups back to the nest. So at this point, I've kind of told you all of the things that make this a really great, robust behavior, unperturbed. Um, but now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about what happens when retrieval goes wrong. Um, and that actually happens in a model of Rett syndrome that we use in the lab. So Rett syndrome in humans is a neurodevelopmental disorder and it's characterized mainly by deficits in social communication and behavior. So um, what's really nifty about Rett syndrome is we actually know the genetic determinant of the disorder. We know exactly which gene is mutated that results in Rett syndrome. So we can take that and we can recapitulate it in a mouse model. And we can then use that to study these types of questions in the lab. So now we have this mouse model of Rett syndrome in the lab and these, when they become surrogates and they have maternal experience, they don't retrieve their pups. So now we have this interesting situation where we have these Rett syndrome model surrogates that don't retrieve. We have normal surrogates, wild type surrogates that do retrieve. And we can see now in their brains what may be going on differently in each that may be underlying their differences in their ability to retrieve the pups. And so that's what um, I study in the majority of my work. So it turns out that if you look at the auditory cortex, there's a particular subpopulation of neurons that appears to be abnormally regulated in our Rett syndrome models. So that's kind of a good first clue as to where we might be looking to find these abnormalities that may be manifesting in the deficits retrieval that our Rett syndrome surrogates are experiencing. And this particular subpopulation is known as the PV or pervalvin positive network. Um, so there's a whole branch of neuroscience dedicated to studying like the, the distinct subpopulations of neurons within the brain. It's a very diverse community up there of, of different cell types. Um, so the provalbumin or PV network are defined by their expression of this PV provalbumin protein. Um, but they're really important uh, network for, for many different reasons, which we can get into if, if any of you are interested. But essentially, I want to draw your attention to some of the abnormalities, abnormalities in the, the RET model surrogates with regards to this PV network, specific to this period of what we call plasticity, 
when the retrieval behavior is being learned. So here are some representative images taken of the auditory cortex of a wild type surrogate on the top and a rep model surrogate on the bottom. And so you can already kind of see the blue here is a pervalbumin staining. So you can see in the RET model that there's a really high intensity or high density of these high intensity stained PV cells, more so than in the wild type, which is already kind of red flag number one, that there's this huge discrepancy, seeing that there might be a role for these PV neurons in mediating this behavior. Um, and then also kind of along those same lines, we see more perineuronal nets in the auditory cortex of the RET model surrogates. And perineuronal nets, they're not neurons, but they are these extracellular matrix proteins. You can kind of think of them as like blankets almost. And they'll basically surround and sheath the PV cells specifically. And when they do, they act as a blockade to synaptic plasticity. And those are kind of big words, but what I mean by that is that neurons are kind of always talking to each other. They're sending and receiving signals back and forth, and that's how anything in the brain ever gets done. But when you have these PNNs, these perineuronal nets surrounding these PV cells, it blocks the ability of those cells to kind of transmit and receive those signals. So it kind of freezes things in place almost, you can think of it like. Um, so the high presence of these perineuronal nets in the auditory cortex surrounding these, uh, these PV cells in our RET model may suggest that not only is there kind of hyperactive PV activity, but we may also be kind of freezing the auditory cortex and closing an essential window of critical period plasticity during which these animals have the opportunity to be learning this retrieval behavior. And that's why they may be exhibiting some deficits. Alrighty. So these are really cool kind of representative images, but they're static images. We wanna see you know, what these PV neurons are doing, like how they're talking to each other, what's their, their activity is basically what, what neuroscientists are really interested in. Um, so we can do that in the lab. We can actually record from and look at the activity of the PV population specifically, which is um, some of what I do for my work. And so I'm just showing you kind of um, the, the activity of these PV cells in both the wild type on the left and the RET model surrogates on the right. And I'm just aligning that activity to a moment when I play back a pup call. We can record the pup calls and play them back whenever we want. So I want to see what these PV neurons are doing responding to this now critical social stimulus, the pup USBs that will drive this behavior ultimately. And we record from these neurons on different days with your maternal exposure and maternal experience. We look at a naive condition, so no pup exposure at all. And then we also continue to record out, as I kind of move down these heat maps, um, successive postnatal days. So postnatal day zero is the day the pups are born, postnatal day one, one day old, et cetera, et cetera. And basically how to read these things is each row is an individual time that I'll play back a pup USB. And then the color corresponds to the strength of the response in the PV population. We're talking about the population level response at this point. And we can go into details of how we actually measure this, but um, we're just looking at responses at this point. And so what I hope you can see from this is basically that in the naive condition, when we play back those pup USBs, there's a really strong response in the wild type surrogates. But then once the pups are born and they have maternal experience, it kind of dampens out, right? And that persists throughout the course of the postnatal day exposure when they're learning and perfecting this retrieval behavior. However, if we look at the RET model, we see kind of the converse occurring uh, where we have kind of basically no response at all in our, in our naive time point, but the responses really start to come online following the exposure to pups. So it's kind of doing a flip-flop or the opposite of what the wild type is doing, which is another clue to saying, hmm, Maybe these PV neurons are really responsible for why the Rett syndrome model surrogates are unable to retrieve. So we have all this evidence that basically suggests that the Rett models are, uh, the PV network is hyperactive, hypermature, and is basically closed to the plasticity necessary for the behavior to be learned um, when the opportunity is present and, and the pups are around. And so a lot of my work is focused on basically looking at a way now to maybe ameliorate these deficits in the RET model and see if there's a way we can suppress PV activity to more wild type levels and rescue the behavior and kind of get them to start retrieving as well. And so that's what I'm focusing on now. I, I have some preliminary data, but nothing to show you really yet. It's, it's still a little too early, um, but the, the main strategy I think I can introduce, this is my, my last slide, I can introduce you to because it's really critical for neuroscience and is widely used and is a really powerful tool. And that's of optogenetics. 
um, which is basically looking to control brain activity using light, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, but um, it's a really powerful tool that a lot of neuroscientists use and I'll try to use to basically suppress the PV activity in the Rett syndrome model to see if I can rescue the behavior. But the, the upshot of how this, this technique works, which I think is pretty cool, is we take a light sensitive protein from algae and that protein is, is one of an ion channel that will actually open in response to blue light. So mice don't have this type of channel. Humans don't have this type of channel. It's, it's really specific to algae. So we basically hijack and steal that gene. Um, and then we put that gene into the DNA of specific neurons in the brain. In my case, we put it into PV neurons. All you have to do is basically shine a light uh, because it's a blue sensitive light. We shine a light into the brain and we can make that neuron fire basically. Um, and the reason we can, we can make it fire and, and firing, I mean, by being activated, basically telling its neighbor, like, Hey, I'm doing a thing in terms of that kind of communication I was talking about earlier, um, by, by basically electrical signal. So this channel that we put into the PV cells will actually open in response to light, allow for ions to move into the cell. And that's kind of the electrical signal that we need to then propagate to the next neuron in line and kind of continue that message going because all electrical signals are, are basically moving ions. Um, so this is what I'm trying to do at the moment, basically manipulate brain activity with light to be able to suppress the PV network in the RET model and ultimately hope to rescue um, the behavior in those animals. And so with that, I would just like to thank you all for your time and attention. Thanks to Jason and the DNA Learning Center for having me. Um, the Shea Lab, um, uh, Steve is our, our fearless leader. Um, my thesis committee who really helps with a lot of um, the ideas that we move forward with with regards to my project. Um, the administrative staff at the, the school over at the lab, and, and lastly, and very importantly, the, my funding to, to keep me here um, uh, generously provided by Tom and Jordan Saunders. Um, so thank you all very much, and I'll, I'll take any questions.